Welcome to the British International Sports Medicine Academy. In this lesson, we're covering the Level 3 unit, Anatomy and Physiology for Exercise. This forms part of our Level 3 Certificate in Personal Training, as well as our Level 3 Diploma in Personal Training. Let's begin with our anatomical planes. When studying level three anatomy and physiology, we focus on three main planes of movement, frontal plane, sagittal plane, and transverse plane. These anatomical planes help to clarify much of the terminology used when discussing body movements, muscle actions, as well as the names and locations of muscles. Let's begin with the frontal plane. The image on the far left, it separates the body into front and back. The joint actions that you can do within this plane are abduction and adduction. Moving on to the sagittal plane, the picture in the middle, that separates the body into left and right. And the joint actions available within this plane of motion are flexion and extension. The last picture in the diagram shown on the right is the transverse plane. And this separates the body into up and down sections. And the joint action available in this plane is rotation. Joint actions. We covered many joint actions at level two. There are a few more that we must cover at level three, beginning with inversion and eversion. This movement occurs at the foot within the transverse plane. Inversion is where the sole turns to face inwards and eversion is where the sole turns to face outwards. Opposition describes the movement of touching the thumb to the fingers. It's what makes us as humans unique from other animals. The shoulder or pectoral girdle is composed of two sets of bones on both sides of the body. We have the clavicles as well as the scapula. Each clavicle articulates at the top of the shoulder with the acrimonium process of the scapula. And this is called the AC joint, a chromioclavicular joint. It's a gliding synovial joint. Each scapula is secured in place by the muscles of the back and shoulder joint. And this gives incredible mobility to the whole shoulder girdle as well as the upper limbs. There is a depression which is called the glenoid cavity and this is found at the top of the scapula directly below the AC joint and this forms the socket that the head of our upper arm bone or humerus fits into and this forms a synovial bowl and socket joint. The shoulder joint is shallow. However, it's responsible for a very large range of movement and therefore it is prone to injury. The stability of the shoulder joint comes primarily from a small group of muscles called our rotator cuff muscles. Movements or joint actions that occur at our glenohumeral or shoulder joint are flexion, extension, including hyperextension, horizontal flexion, horizontal adduction, horizontal extension or horizontal abduction, abduction, adduction, rotation and circumduction, dislocation as well as damage to joint tissues, the bones and the surrounding muscles are common within this joint. Our two long bones in our lower arms, the radius and the ulna, attach with the distal head of the humerus to create a hinge joint at the elbow. As it's a hinge joint, only flexion and extension are available. Hyperextension or locking out of the elbow can cause the articular surfaces or bone ends to rub together. And this will cause damage to the cartilage, the joint capsule and the surrounding ligaments. The radius and ulna are also connected at their distal ends and this joint is called the radio ulnar joint. They are also connected down the whole length of both bones by a fibrous, slightly movable membrane. The interosseous membrane. Unlike at the elbow, where the ulna is more prominent, the radius is far more prominent at the wrist. Here it articulates with two of the carpal bones to form a synovial joint that allows flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. The ulna has a very small connection at the wrist and therefore it's not involved in movement. Our pelvic girdle is very important 
it transmits the whole weight of our upper body down through the legs to the ground. It plays a major role in ensuring the correct alignment of the spine, allowing us to hit our neutral spine position. And unlike the pectoral or shoulder girdle, it needs to be strong, stable, and resistant to large ranges of movement. It is composed of two bones on each side. These two bones are made up of three separate bones, the ilium, ischium, and pubic bones, which fuse together in adulthood to form the pelvic girdle. The knee joint is secured internally by two sets of cruciate ligaments at both the front and back of the joint, which form a cross. The cruciate ligaments add stability to the knee joint. The patella is a sesamoid shaped bone developed inside the tendon of one of the main thigh muscles, which crosses the front of the joint and protects our knee. The patella ligament is technically an extension of a muscle tendon. Have a look at the diagram shown and point out the cruciate ligaments, as well as the articular cartilage that line the bone ends, and also look out for the meniscus. The meniscus reinforce the articular cartilage. You have lateral and medial cartilaginous C-shaped wedges and these are called meniscus. The menisci help to stabilize our joint by preventing lateral displacement of the bones. The foot and the hand are structured very similarly. The tarsal bones are cuboid and connect with each other via gliding synovial joints. There are seven tarsals, but the two largest ones, nearest the lower leg, mainly carry the body weight. These are the talus bones that connect with the tibia and fibula, and the large calcaneus or heel bone on which the talus sits. The talus, the tibia and fibula create a synovial hinge joint and the joint actions available at this joint are plantar and dorsiflexion within the sagittal plane. It is the gliding joints between the talus, the calcaneus and all of the other tarsal bones that give the whole foot the flexibility for us to walk or run on uneven surfaces by allowing inversion and eversion movement. Core and posture. Posture is defined as the arrangement of body parts in a state of balance. What is correct posture? Correct posture provides a solid foundation for all movements to follow from. It allows for biomechanical efficiency, which will reduce the risk of injury, reduce the risk of degeneration of our muscles and joints, and it also improves the balance between the right and left sides, as well as the front and back of the body. How do we achieve core stability? The passive system is to adopt a neutral spine, so correcting our spinal column alignment. The active system is tensing our local and global muscles, so that's all of our core muscles, our rectus abdominis, our interior and external obliques, our transverse abdominis, our erector spinae, and so forth. Neural control. This is engaged when our proprioceptive nerves are feeding back to our central nervous system to make corrections in posture. Heart and circulatory system. The heart. In addition to what we learned at level two, we're also going to learn the names of the heart valves. The valves prevent the backflow of blood into the wrong chamber or wrong area of the body. On the left side of the heart, you have the bicuspid valve, also known as the mitral or mitral valve. And this is found between the left atrium and the left ventricle. On the right side of the heart, you have the tricuspid valve. And this is found between the right ventricle and the right atrium. You also have the aortic valve that you find between the left ventricle and the aorta and the pulmonary valve between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. The bicuspid and tricuspid valves are also known as atrioventricular valves because they are found between the atrium and the ventricles. The pulmonary and aortic valve are also known as the semilunar valves because of their shape. As we've stated previously, our heart is a muscle and it also requires a blood supply that is rich in oxygen in order for it to contract. The blood supply for the heart is supplied by coronary arteries. These arteries keep our myocardium supplied with oxygen. 
The left anterior descending artery supplies the anterior portion of our left atrium and ventricle with oxygenated blood. The left circumflex artery supplies the posterior portion of our left atrium and left ventricle with oxygenated blood. The right coronary artery supplies the right atrium and right ventricle with oxygenated blood. The nervous system. As shown on the slide, we have the central nervous system consisting of our brain and spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system consists of the nerves stemming from the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is then divided in the somatic and autonomic sections. The somatic is what is under our conscious control and the autonomic is what is under our unconscious control. The automatic is then divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic is responsible for speeding up bodily processes and the parasympathetic brings everything back to homeostasis. The peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system or PNS consists of the incoming and outgoing nerves to our spinal cords. These nerves are classed as afferent or efferent nerves. The afferent nerves are the sensory neurons carrying information about changes within our external and internal body environment. The afferent nerves carry information about the required response to a change. The endocrine system. Our endocrine system works very closely with the nervous system to maintain balance or homeostasis within the body. If our central nervous system receives information from an afferent nerve to show that the body is out of a balanced state, an efferent nerve may then send information directly to stimulate a response or it may send information to an endocrine gland to release a hormone. Remember, hormones are chemical messengers within the body. The human endocrine system. Have a look at all of the glands found in the body. Let's begin with the hypothalamus and pituitary glands. You can find these at the base of our brain and the main hormone they're responsible for secreting is our growth hormone. One of the functions of the growth hormone is to increase fat metabolism, increase our glycogen synthesis, increase the blood glucose levels, and promote growth in children and young adults. It also promotes muscle mass. Moving down to our adrenals, which are located on the top of both of our kidneys. The main hormones they release are adrenaline and noradrenaline, and they facilitate sympathetic nervous system activity, so speeding things up. The adrenals also release corticosteroids, which regulate stress and immune responses and control carbohydrate fats and protein metabolism. The thyroid can be found in the neck and the main hormone released is thyroxin. Thyroxin has similar function to our growth hormone. The parathyroid is also found in the neck behind our thyroid gland and the main hormone released is the parathyroid hormone and this controls the levels of blood calcium which help to maintain muscle contraction as well as nerve impulse transmission. The pancreas is located in our abdominal cavity very very close to our stomachs and the main hormone release is insulin and glucagon which both control blood sugar levels. Within our ovaries for females Estrogen and progesterone are produced and they promote our feminine characteristics. Within the testes, testosterone is produced and they promote masculine characteristics. Thank you for listening.